So I'm Nicholas, or Nico Matsakis. This is Ashley Williams. And Hi. <laughs> and we're going to do a talk about doing open source on purpose, intentionally. But before we do that, uh, so you may or may not know, but in the next couple weeks, Rust 2018 is coming out. Uh, actually, the release candidate 2, more specifically, which will become the final Rust 2018 release, hopefully squeaking into 2018 before the next year. Uh, we'll see. But it's going to be pretty exciting. And in particular, so 2018 kind of sums up right the, the work. We're kind of retconning in the work, all the work we've done over the last three years into this 2018 edition. Um, and it's a good time for us to, to stop and, and kind of ask ourselves, well, what have we done over the last three years? You know, what, how did we get here? What is our trajectory? And how do we feel about it? And should we maybe make some alterations? So we, we're, and in this talk, we're going to be focusing a lot on not so much the technical parts of what we've done over the last three years, but on the engineering that goes into the sort of team structure and the way the project manages and makes decisions and runs itself. <laughs> And so if you ask, how did we get here? Well, I don't know. I've been at Mozilla now seven years working on Rust. And I can tell you that in the beginning, we didn't have a lot of structure. We had kind of Mozilla employees doing the majority of the coding, I would say. And the decisions were made kind of in an ad hoc basis on group meetings. Graydon was the core team lead, or sorry, the team lead. But you know, he ran with a light touch, and we kind of made decisions as a group. Uh, and eventually, that, that was becoming a problem. And around 1.0, we announced. The, the first Rust teams, right? And the reason was twofold. First, there were all these people who had done enormous amounts of work on the project, but they weren't Mozilla employees, and they didn't have an official say in any of the decisions, really. We had no, they had no formal recognition, and that didn't seem sort of right to us. But also, if we were going to bring Rust and scale it up, we had to stop funneling decisions through the same two or three or four people. We had to really have a lot of people moving so we could do things independently from one another. And in that time, we've grown the teams a lot. Right, so that what started with a relatively small group, this is a chart prepared by David Tolney, wherever he is, uh, <laughs> uh, that shows the kind of growth over the time. Right? And you can see not only did we grow a lot, we grew a lot lately in the last uh, chunk of six months or so, um, 10 months. And the reason is because we've been putting a lot of focus on that. Right? This is not an accident. It's been a deliberate effort of us to, to grow and expand the teams precisely so that we can scale better. So. Hold on, Ashley, talk. I know. Oh, no. OK, this was our it's good fine. Handoff. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so I have been giving a fair amount of conference talks, I guess, for a while. But lately, I've been really hung up on this idea of what do programming languages want. Um, and the reason I like focusing on this is because it turns out that there's a lot of effort that's put into all of these things. But rarely do we step back and ask ourselves, what are we building and why? And so I've asked this question kind of in general, but I love to ask it about Rust. And so Rust has always kind of been about this idea of technical excellence. We say, all right, there are these trade-offs in computer science, but what if they didn't have to be a trade-off? What if we could get all of the things? Our classic pick three slogan, like we can do it all. And you know, that means that we're like very strongly, like really heavily computer science based. And you know what they say about computer science. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And so uh, we always talk about the hardest problems in computer science, but I'm a strong proponent of the idea that the real hardest problem in computer science is people. They are by far the most complex distributed system that exists, and I will fight you on that topic because I have lived this personally. And uh, if you've ever done any work with people, which potentially as a computer scientist, maybe you've been trying to avoid it, um, people. Pretty tough. Um, people are a really incredibly difficult problem, and it's something that we're working on. Uh, but fundamentally, Rust has also always been a programming language that's focused on empowerment. Not only do we want to make a technically excellent product, but our goal is to take systems programming and widen the audience that can actually use it. And that's what a lot of our work on the productivity and ergonomic stuff has been. And that's been really important. And it turns out to get that stuff right, you really need people, both people building it and people using it and people giving you feedback. And we're going to be talking about feedback giving in a second. Um, but luckily for us, we're Rust, and we have a lot of amazing people. Raise your hand here if you're on a Rust team. All right, give those people, uh, come on, it's time for the. <laughs> All 
All right. So from that point on, Nico is now going to start talking about growing teams. Thank you for that very well performed handoff, Ashley. They're only going to so, get smoother. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about you know where where are all these people on the Rust team? How did they all come to be here? And, and what are the things I showed you that graph that's been climbing lately? What are the things we've been doing to to do that to make that growth happen? And I think these lessons apply you know they apply to Rust, but they apply to any sort of open source project and probably non open source project that you're trying to build in the end. Um, and so there's been this I think I think. The, tr the sort of simplest, the way a lot of us start, I think, when you come to open source is this idea of there's all these people writing code and things kind of just appear out of nowhere, right? And st like great things, right? And sometimes that's true. So like Vern Sushi came with this regex crate and none of us were, we just kind of, we knew we needed to, to do regular expressions at some point uh, in 2014, but it wasn't like a top priority item and there it was and it was great. Um, there's kind of this, this serendipity aspect, right? Where you get these really nice surprises and they just happen. Um, but sometimes surprises, are not always good. Sometimes you get a PR and you're kind of like, mm, yeah, that's not the way I had in mind. It's not, <laughs> it's not quite what I was thinking of, right? <laughs> and, and sometimes you end up, if you, if you just kind of let it happen any which way, you end up with this kind of cacophonous effect where everybody's kind of running with the project in whatever direction they had in mind, but it may not be forming a coherent whole. And by the way, this is a poster from my old guitar teacher, and, and that's me. <laughs> Over there, uh, <laughs> in the corner, uh, and he's great. If you're in Boston, you should check out Sam Davis. Anyway, okay. So the thing is, there's another side of this too, which is that serendipity is is sometimes really excellent, but it's also there are a lot of people who don't want to participate that way, who don't want to just pick up a project with like no docs and no idea what's going on and just open a PR, right? Uh, and so you're losing a large portion of the people who might be involved in your project if you just leave it up to chance. So what we would rather do is approach it in this kind of deliberate, on-purpose, strategic way of how can we widen the set of people who are bringing in, who are, who are participating, right? And actually, the first step is kind of non-obvious, although it sounds obvious, which is that you should ask people to help. Uh, and the reason that's non-obvious is a lot of times we feel like we're the only ones who can do it. I'm the only one who understands this project. I'm the only one who, can, who knows how this problem works, or I can do it the best. And that might be true, you might be the fastest, but you're probably not the only one who can do it. Right? Um, and so, so when you ask, it's also important to think about kind of how you ask. Uh, if you just kind of open an issue that says, well, I need some help, you're kind of shouting into the void a lot of times. But if you can give people some instructions, some steps, that can be a much better. So like one popular thing for getting a lot of work done, where there's a lot of repetitive work to do, is to make what we call a quest issue, which is like a checklist and some instructions for how to do an item, and people can come in when they have a little time and, and just tack off one or two. Right? They don't have to do the whole thing. Um, this is very. This is a much easier way to get involved in the project than having to stake out something all on your own. Uh, and in general, I guess there's just this 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 uh, need to be building a space for people to participate. A way thinking about what it feels like to get involved and making sure that that there's a, a place for them to move into. Right. So sometimes that might mean doing a little bit of the work, enough that people can see the shape of what you want to do, but not finishing it. Right? So in this first PR that I opened uh, some time ago to, to add mirror to the compiler, which is the intermediate representation we're using, I left various holes, right? So it didn't really work. It only handled this print. It could add two numbers, that's it. But it was enough that people can get in and see what I had in mind. And, and it, the final product looked very different than that skeleton, but that's okay, right? That wasn't the point. Um, and in general, I would say just moving your planning and uh, moving your operations out of your head and into public spheres where people can give you feedback and just uh, and be involved. Um, and that will also help them to follow along with what you have in mind. Right? It gives you a chance to sort of articulate your vision for how this should work and uh, make that known. So Rust does this at a lot of levels. This is part of the role of the roadmap at the highest level, sort of setting the direction of the project on a yearly basis. Uh, which, by the way, we're going to be starting soon, I think, in the next year roadmap process, and, and kind of going on down right, for at, at different scales. And the final step is you have to tell people how great they're doing, but not only tell them. It's not enough, I think, really, to just say you're the best. You, ideally, they should be also gaining, as they get more experienced, you should be starting to share <laughs> some of the power. Right? They're probably going to have ideas that may not be just the ones that you had, and that's okay. 
a lot of times those ideas are actually uh, really good, and they can be kind of taking the project in directions that weren't what you originally had in mind, but were actually better. Um, so one simple example uh, that I remember is, just because it made an impression on me, was Eddie B was at that time, he's now a pretty, pretty well-known Rust contributor, but at that time he was relatively new, and I remember we were planning to add these DREF traits to the compiler, and I thought, well, I guess I'm going to roll up my sleeves and do that in a few weeks. Of course, like two days later, Eddie B had a PR open because he's really fast. Uh, and uh, when I was looking through it, I, I realized this, this isn't how I was going to do it. It's actually much better than the way I was going to do it, and this patch was much cleaner and smaller. And so we ended up taking it, and it was great. Um, so sometimes things kind of don't go the way you expect, but that's all right. Oh, no. So now Ash is going to talk. So uh, Nico's talked a little bit about the practical elements of things that you can do to help grow your project, get more people involved, and make sure that they want to stay. Uh, but what I'd like to do in a, a classic Ashley stance is get a little bit more philosophical um, and talk about some of the underlining values and assumptions that are in all of these types of actions. And so the two key components that I'm going to talk about right now are the ideas of pluralism and positive sums. And so I just Googled the definition of pluralism, as one does. And so pluralism is a condition or system in which two or more states, groups, principles, et cetera, can coexist. And so with that idea of having all of these different ideas together, all of these different types of people, a diverse set of ideas coming together, then we have to have some sort of game plan, right? And so here's the classic meme. It's time for some game theory. Yeah. Um, so, in general, when people tend to think about these things, they often think in a zero-sum game. And so, in a zero-sum game, basically, a participant's gain or loss is exactly balanced by the losses of gains of another participant in the game. And fundamentally, we want to reject this idea. And so, you can think of this as, your gain is my loss. And if you need any sort of example, you can open the Orange website or maybe Reddit. Um, and you're going to see right away that a lot of the you know, infuriating statements and energy that's happening there is because people fundamentally believe that in order to get their idea, someone else's idea has to fail. There's, theirs needs to be correct and there needs to be another one that's failing. And one of the principal ideas of Rust's organizational structure is that that's simply not the case. So we believe in something that's called a positive sum game, which is a situation in which the total gains and losses in a situation is greater than zero. So that means that my gain doesn't necessarily have to mean your loss, and that I can have gains. <laughs> we did not schedule those. Um, <laughs> Anyways, the idea is that in order for me to get something that I want, it does not mean that someone else somewhere, somewhere needs to lose something. Um, and while that seems like to be a somewhat simple concept, it's, in it's incredibly difficult to actually really think and believe in this way, and in particular to run with a large set of people with a lot of ideas and still genuinely believe in this idea. Um, but in the end, it's a little kumbaya, right? But we believe that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, which is to say we have all of these people working in Rust, and Rust is better than adding them all up together because we are working together, and that working together is actually creating value on its own. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of a gamble. A lot of systems don't work this way, and I have to imagine that people in this room have been parts of organizations where we were not believing in that and probably experienced something entirely different, something maybe much more adversarial. Uh, but we can kind of think of Rust in a certain way as Captain Planet, right? Where we have a lot of different audiences in Rust. So we have you know, people who are just working on Rust, just that, and maybe C++ developers coming in too to share their perspectives. We've got some JavaScript people in there. JavaScript's awesome, don't hate JavaScript. Um, also academics, and also just brand new developers. Yes, some people learn to develop by writing Rust, which I think is amazing. Um, so we have all of these different groups of people coming together, and maybe we can form Captain Rust, and that's going to be awesome. However, as I said, this is kind of a work in progress, and sometimes it ends up like this. Yeah, I've been there, and probably you have too. So what we're trying to do is this, right? It's like, OK, we want truly open consensus seeking, and we're asking, can we scale it? At the beginning, right, it was just a couple of people. And uh, as you grow and grow and grow, um, you kind of have to keep asking yourselves, you know, are we web scale? Um, 
Yeah, also, the trick with this meme, I guess, is that when he turns that blender on, our like, ideals go get all crunched up. I don't know, I didn't think it through. Um, <laughs> but anyways, the truth of the matter is, is I spend a lot of time having doubts that these fundamental values and assumptions we have are going to work. And a lot of our leadership also kind of has these feelings, but I do genuinely want to believe. And what we're seeing now is that there are a couple of instances and kind of patterns we're seeing that are, are growing pains, the scaling pains of this truly uh, open consensus. And so these are some ideas from Aaron Turon's, uh, what I call his feelings blog, where he blogs about management. If you don't know about it, you should absolutely check it out because it's brilliant. Uh, but a couple of the issues we've run into, first is this idea of momentum, which is it's hard to shift whatever sentiment is first established. Uh, I was once told when I started writing RFCs that RFCs don't usually ever survive their first comment, which is to say, whatever that first comment on that RFC is going to be, that's going to set the tone for the whole conversation. So hope and pray, or maybe you know, ping someone and be like, please comment first, please. Um, I want this to work out. Uh, but that can be really tricky. Uh, and so we've seen this happen on a whole bunch of RFCs. Uh, and it's worth noting that if you find yourself in a conversation like this, you know, scroll up, see, was this entire maybe sidetracked part of the conversation just started by a first potentially aggressive comment? It's definitely possible. The next one is just fundamentally that it, the stakes are high. So people are feeling incredibly urgent. Not only are they commenting a lot, but they're commenting fast. And I think it's very interesting in Rust because we all desperately want Rust to succeed that we kind of feel like we have to race to that success. And so because everything feels like it matters so much, we're going incredibly quickly. And it just turns out that giving everyone the benefit of the doubt and caring about people is really hard if you're all racing at like light speed to try and get something done. That speed really accentuates a lot of the problems with the, the organizational structures that we have. And then finally, and how many people in here sometimes feel really tired? Yeah, me too. All right. And part of it is a result of this attempt to bring so many people into this project. It's genuinely hard to participate and often doesn't feel like progress is being made because there is so much happening and so many people. And while these three things are things that we are struggling with right now and patterns that we're finding, we're really interested in trying to find ways to fix them. Uh, but they are the things that we struggle with. So a lot of these things end up happening because fundamentally, when people respond to change, they don't respond logically. Despite that we all probably are really logical, like we really like computers, we do a logical, fundamentally we are responding emotionally, kind of like this. Like, oh, let's remove mod keyword. Yeah, he's pissed about it. He also hates lettuce. I think he's just, I think he's just hungry, I don't know. <laughs> Um, good. And that's a sentiment that we honestly see a lot. And so this is kind of a, a vague summary of a recent RFC process that went down where it just was basically like people felt luckily enough, luckily enough of us yelled to stop the terrifying original proposal from happening. The moment we stop speaking up, those people will start put, that mic will start feedback again, those people will start pushing in that direction again. Like fundamentally, it's this idea of wielding power versus changing minds. And often because of those three things that I was bringing up, those three patterns we see, people will reach for that hammer and being like, I want to take my power and make it work. This feedback sucks. Um, the idea of wanting to take some power instead of trying to do the work of changing minds. I had a, I used to be a middle school science teacher. And one of my teacher buddies told me, Ashley, you need to remember, it's Tai Chi, not karate. Uh, and it works with teaching kids. It also happens to work with trying to do organizational change. Um, and so we often, if we need like a visual here, you might kind of feel as though the core team is that big cat swatting down that little cat. We're the people in power. And if you don't keep fighting us, we're just going to do what we want to do. And interestingly enough, it kind of works both ways because sometimes the core team feels like the little cat and we feel like the community is the big cat saying, we have a lot of time and energy and we're not going to let this happen. But that's really not how we should be looking at it. We really should be kind of looking at it like this. 
the idea is to try and see it from other people's perspectives. And again, a lot of this might seem like banal advice, but it's shockingly difficult and rarely seen in practice. And so one of the fun things about Rust is, kind of as Nico said, is that we've seen so many RFCs uh, filed maybe by core team members where people from the community will show up and come up with like a really amazing idea that we didn't even think of. And it's just like, that's freaking awesome. So it's not always this adversarial situation. Um, but yeah, you know, we could change our perspective here. As Nico said, maybe he just is hungry. Didn't get a good night's sleep. It's possible. All right, so I put this really cute dog with a pumpkin here because it's about to get real. I'm gonna talk about feelings for a second um, because I think it's important. So uh, recently, how many people here use, oh. I was slow. All right, so how many people here use Crates.io? All right, so recently, Crates.io had an interesting operational incident. This is a screen cap from me filling out our status page report. And what the message says is, we are currently seeing intermittent performance issues we believe we have identified the cause as malicious end user behavior and have taken actions to address it. So we've just here been talking about all this work of bringing people in and sometimes some not great things happen. So this is a screenshot from a different orange website than the classic one, but still orange. Um, and it's talking about an issue that I know is very important to a lot of people here in this room. And the first thing I wanna say is I am not here to diminish your points of view and your opinions. Your care is literally why we include you in everything. However, I saw a lot of comments on this, some I wish I hadn't seen, um, but one of the comments really stood out to me. And it's a comment here that you can see that has 122 upvotes. So it must have rang a bell with people. And it says, the reason that Crates.io squatting problems are coming, becoming ridiculous, and it's implied here about probably a lack of action, is because the core Rust developers believe in the inherent goodness of people. Bless. So the trick about this is, I think, I mean, it's hard to know what people really mean, but I got the sense that maybe this was sarcastic. And what I want to say is it struck me because fundamentally, like everything we've been talking about in this talk is we like really do. We really do genuinely believe in the goodness and value of the people in our community. And to see someone kind of sarcastically throw that at us almost like an attack was like, wow, like, no, this is like a fundamental value of Rust. I don't, I'm not sure how you missed it, but this is the whole thing. And in fact, to a certain extent, in order to try and accomplish what we want to accomplish, particularly with our goals of being an empowering technology, we have to believe that. If we didn't, what, what's the point? We, we couldn't accomplish any of this. There would, be, there would be absolutely no point. And so when I read comments, this is the face I make. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, I, I kind of permanently just am like sad, uh, grumpy on the computer reading comments. But I think so, a, point, a part of being a leader in an open source project that you don't realize is that while we might kind of be kind of grouchy or maybe cynical sometimes. Our primary job is this. Um, we, uh, we read all those comments. And instead of really getting upset, what we actually do is go, what have we done wrong? What, what is it that we have done wrong that, that has caused this? Like We have not created the right pathways for communication. We have not properly communicated our values. We have not opened up processes the way we should have. And so when we see behavior like this, it really affects us. And it's not to be whiny and stuff, but sometimes like the amount of emotional labor that we are doing on a regular basis can cause a whole different type of fatigue than the one I was talking about with just, oh my gosh, there's so much. Um, trying to like see the benefit of everything and be positive with people can be really tough and for real. Um, so this was another comment, uh, and it said this. It said, personally, I'm not a fan of any statement containing the words, it cannot be done, or it's equivalent. Yes, it can. You just don't want to, which can be OK, perhaps. Um, I get, you know, I, I empathize with this a lot. I, I know where it's coming from. But at a certain point, one of the things you have to realize is everyone is just humans, and like, 
if people think that everyone in the core team gets what they want, oh my goodness. Um, it, it's just not true. And fundamentally, you know, sometimes I really can't. Like, a lot of the things that I want to get done, I just really can't. And neither can the core team. There's a lot on our, wi our like, wish list that we would absolutely love to get done. And we're kind of bound by the fact that we only have so much time. And while this could start sounding whiny, I don't mean it that way, because we're also here to say that sometimes we can't, and sometimes that's our fault. So this is another comment. It says, however, as mentioned, even by the Reddit mods, the topic of squatting comes up once a week. It is a problem that needs to be discussed and taken seriously, and several members of the Rust community, as seen in this thread and in numerous Reddit threads, feel that it has not been taken seriously and repeatedly been dismissed. And, you know, it's true. We have messed up stuff. We are not perfect communicators, and fundamentally it's on us to change that. And so this talk is not only just us talking about the, ta the tactics that we use to try and grow the project, but it's also an adm admitting that like we are still working on it and we still haven't gotten there yet. So despite the fact that we kind of make jokes about online comments or RFCs that get 300 comments, like we don't believe it's all the community's fault. And there's a lot of work for both the community but also leadership to make this happen. I have a mic here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so yeah, this, this actually is a theme that's come up for us numerous times. Uh, we, we actually have even have a saying about it, which we call the core team must, but the core team can't. And it's a particular pathology that I think can arise where you have, uh, it, the, the, the quote was not actually from Florian Skade, but uh, we sort of arrived at it from some, some emails that he sent to us. And, and the problem was, what ha can happen is that you can see something is very important, so important that you feel like we should really deal with it ourselves but we don't actually have time to deal with it, so it just doesn't get dealt with, right? And, and then there's like no, no, and you don't provide a way for someone who is motivated to have a road in and pick it up and run with it, right? And so the secret, the, the sort of secret I wanted to tell you from the first part where I kind of showed you all these strategies for building your open source project is that if you succeed, the nature of that work is going to change, right? Uh, and sometimes that might not be what you had in mind. Like you started out writing code, and now there's like 20 people trying to to contribute and, and you have to like work with them and build consensus and manage this project and it's a it's a different kind of work. And it's a kind of work that often isn't quite as, as valued or as recognized, I think, in the open source community. And so there aren't as many people who sort of have those skills or who you don't necessarily they don't necessarily think that they should they could use those skills as part of an open source project. Right. And so I'm here to say you can. If you'd like to organize, you should talk to us. Uh, but but also that it's really important. Um, and there's this other part that's sort of a little more insidious, where sometimes you were the one making the decisions. Everything was going just the way you had in mind. And now, you know, somebody else is coming with their suggestions. And maybe they're even better than yours. And maybe you even recognize that. But that doesn't mean you like it, right? <laughs> uh, that definitely happens from time to time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a. So the theme of this talk is this idea of being deliberate. And because I am insufferable, and pedantic, I googled the definition, and there's a couple of really interesting ones in here. So one of the primary things of being deliberate is by doing stuff, you know, kind of with like a full consciousness of the nature and effects, or, or trying to be intentional. And that's certainly something that in the Rust team we're trying to do. But uh, the one that I think is the most important and probably the most controversial is uh, this last one here, which says, unhurried in action, movement, or manner, as if trying to avoid error. See synonyms at slow. So this is only my personal opinion, but I have talked to many people in leadership and other parts of the organization, and we heard ourselves talking about this urgency and fatigue in Rust. And my kind of claim for Rust 2019 is, let's go slow. I think a lot of the things that we have succeeded with have happened because we moved fast, um, but we move fast at a cost. And I'm not sure I'm super willing to incur that cost anymore, and I don't think that the trade-off for that cost is as worth it these days. And so I'm really curious to see how we can build capacity over the next year so that maybe at some point we can start moving super fast again. But I think there's an opportunity here to slow down and think about what we're doing. And maybe we can do just a little bit less of this. 
So my call is that I'd like to see us all be deliberate together. Uh, not only leadership, but also the community. Whoops, I didn't switch my slide. Um, because in the end, that is what is going to bring Rust to the success that we all really want to see it have. Yeah, so to bring it back way to the beginning, we're at the addition. We now covered where we are, our trajectory. So what do we want to see over the next addition, over the next three years, let's say? Um, I think we've proven by now that you don't need a GC for memory safety. And I think what we're trying to prove is that you don't need a dictator to have a good language, right? You can do it as a community-driven process. <laughs> that was your cue. <laughs> um, Just keep clapping. And you know, we have fearless concurrency today. We would like to get more of this concurrency, but amongst our teams, so that we can all, so that we can go fast, but without uh, incurring some of the costs. And I think we, most importantly, like we have thread safety, right? But uh, let's try and get some thread safety on uh, the RFCs and internals, maybe. Yeah. All right. So to kind of bring it to a close, uh, I'm going to soon be doing a track host for QCon on the 21st century languages. And you know, it turns out that the vast majority of modern languages have picked a governance model that is almost exactly the opposite of what we are doing in Rust. And something that's really amazing is that we have like this great opportunity to prove that a modern language not only can, but absolutely should run as a radically open pluralist project. And the best part about it is that we are all going to have to do that together. And the opportunity to prove that that's an option is like right in front of us. Like That's the work that we get to do. And I think that it's going to be incredibly ex exciting when we actually succeed, because I believe we can. So finally, I'd like to say, please join us. You can join teams, if you did not know that. Reach out. Um, we want you all to be involved. Thanks.